And when we start to read the books in Spiritism and truly study the doctrine in depth, we begin to see so many similarities between what the Freemasons, most of the founding fathers who were Freemasons, the ideas are present in both the Spiritist doctrine and the Freemason philosophy. And even to the Declaration of Independence, which is a very short document, but such an important document, where when we examine it, not just with our brains, but we feel the document with our heart, it is incredibly inspired. And we can look at just the, the most famous paragraph, which is the third paragraph, I believe, where he says, we hold these truths to be self-evident reasoning, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So liberty being a very central theme. Freedom, individual freedom. And the pursuit of happiness is that the conditions of this country, of the society, are going to allow the individual through his free will, through his efforts, to pursue his individual happiness as he sees fit. And when we examine that the Founding Fathers had to, put up, had to put the most incredible obstacles against the largest army in the world, the British Empire, and a group of farmers led by George Washington, who sacrificed himself so many times, including going hungry and almost dying of cold because they lacked the resources, they lacked the financial support to be able to defeat the British army. Still, miraculously, they're able to defeat the greatest army in the world through in the American Revolution. And when we look at the last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, we see the following paragraph. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Level of commitment and conviction that these men had in 1776 where democracy was barely an idea in its embryonic stages, where this was, would be considered treason in Europe, in most countries, for them to sign this. So the level of courage for them to write this down, to assemble a team of 56 signers and sign this document and then have to face the largest army in the history of the planet for the next few years is incredible. And many of them perished, many of them lost their fortunes, Many of them were imprisoned, had their goods confiscated. So they personally sacrificed. They, they went through a sacrifice themselves in order to sign this. And Emmanuel, in, this, in the book On the Way to the Light, says, says that in this moment that democracy was consecrated in this land. It was actually materialized. And we see echoes of this in other parts of the world, like Brazil, where the Inconfidencia Mineira was an an attempt to do the same thing because they were being inspired by the American Revolution, but they lacked the necessary resources and the people around them in order to materialize a similar independence from Portugal because it was just not in the plans of the spirit realm, right? So when we go to New York and we see the Statue of Liberty, we begin to understand that that's a powerful symbol that also is deeply ingrained in the American psyche, which is welcoming the spirits from other lands, the immigrants that were tired, that they were hungry, and they were yearning to breathe free in this new land. The Statue of Liberty is a symbol of welcome to them. And there is a poem that's inscribed in the, at the foot of the Statue of Liberty that was written by Emma Lazarus, who was a Portuguese Jewish immigrant, and whose poem actually inspired many philanthropic and charitable causes at the time for the sake of the immigrants that were coming with diseases that needed housing. And this poem was so inspired, and at the same time it encapsulates this idea of bringing free spirits into the new world, new immigrants from the old world. The name of the poem is called The New Colossus. And it says, Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. So she's making a reference to the Rhodes in ancient Greece, which was considered one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. 
not like that one. But she's making a distinction. Here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning. A mighty woman with a torch holding on her hand, right? The flame is the imprisoned lightning. Lightning, the symbol of the brain, of enlightening the mind, right? And her name is Mother of Exiles, greeting and welcoming all those with goodwill who are tired of the struggles in Europe. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. She says, quote, Keep ancient lands your storied pomp. Right? The notion of classes and rigid aristocracy. Keep ancient lands. You keep that, your storied pomp. Cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So it's amazing because it echoes what Emmanuel talks about as the role of the new world, the Americas, as a place to receive the new refugees. And he says, under Jesus' orientation, the invisible plan conducts to America all the sincere and hard-working spirits that no longer needed reincarnations in Europe. He says, the countless groups of good-willed souls departed from the invisible realm to reincarnate in the new lands as children of the outcasts who had emigrated and who came because they were persecuted by the iniquity of human justice. They just wanted to practice their religion. That's all they wanted to do. Joining these more or less advanced exiles were many European spirits who had grown weary of the inglorious struggles of hegemony and ambition and were looking for redemption in the new constructive effort of a new homeland on the solid basis of fraternity and love. It's amazing, right? It's a privilege to be in this country and understand the rich spiritual heritage. And we're so bombarded by the media of all the negative aspects of it that it's so nice to be able to read something refreshing that emphasizes and reminds us of the positive, idealistic goals that the spirit realm, the higher ups that help us in our evolution, have for this land. We can talk about many of the Founding Fathers here individually, but all of them had fascinating lives, including George Washington, the first president of this country. We see the influence of their Freemason and their religious spiritual values behind all of their actions, including Benjamin Franklin, who is probably one of the most brilliant of the Founding Fathers, a scientist, an inventor, a philosopher, a diplomat, and who actually is one of the signers of the Spiritist Codification. So Benjamin Franklin, uh, a few years after he passes away in 1790, in the 1850s, he's already in the spirit realm, actively collaborating in the work of bringing the new revelation of spiritual knowledge through Kardec and so many other mediums all over the world. And he's one of the signers along St. Augustine. So to be able to see a founding father of America as a signer of the Spiritist codification is actually quite astonishing, it's quite beautiful for us to make the connection. So when we see that the Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we see that the vision of the Founding Fathers was one of motivating, of encouraging, empowering the individual to be the one who promotes his own liberation, his own growth. And so these notions of individual freedom and individual responsibility that they echoed and they were able to implement in the foundations of this country are also seen in Spiritism when we see a body of work that is progressive in its revelation, a body of knowledge that continues to absorb 
from the sciences around and the discoveries in order to grow and expand itself, we see the notions of individual responsibility and moral autonomy, where I, in my own conscience, within myself, know only what's the best for me to do. And acting out of my own conscience, I'm going to do the best choices for myself, which may be different from the person next to me. And Emmanuel, in the book Hoteiru, which in English would be Roadmap, he has a lesson, which is chapter number 33, and it's entitled Individualism. And he says the following, Effort and improvement of the unit for the progress and sublimation of the whole. That is a law. And when the Founding Fathers had that vision of the Freemasons who brought the ancient knowledge of Egypt and so many secret societies that were carrying these spiritual teachings all the way to today, where the world of democracy would be one where perfected human beings would be able to be guides of themselves and through this moral transformation be able to build a harmonious society on the solid basis of fraternity and love, we see that these are firmly echoed in Spiritism. So to be able to study the Founding Fathers is to be able to understand the deep, rich spiritual heritage of this country and further understand the treasures that we can find in the works of Spiritism. For the